shout and touch the Lord as He passes by. You find He's not too busy to hear your cry. He's passing by this moment your needs to supply. Reach out. Tonight, let's take our Bibles and turn in the Old Testament to the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 18, number 18, Godly Wisdom. We're going to see godly wisdom here in these verses. Some of them seem related, some seem not related. They're all wisdom from the Lord. And the first 12 verses, I think, talk about wisdom as relates to God, being wise toward God. And then verses 13 to 24, wisdom toward others. So wisdom towards God, wisdom towards others, and we want to make sure that we're wise in all areas. And so Kelly's going to open us in prayer, and then we're going to dive right in. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you. We ask that you would be with Pastor now as he teaches the full word of God. Help me to be a blessing and a helper to him. And as we bring forth your word, we ask you to bless this time now and bless everything that we do and say. May it glorify you and be with those who are listening. Help us to hide the word in our hearts and be with those who are listening now and in the future and help them to truly grow by the words that they're about to hear. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen and amen. Speaking of wisdom, uh, James, the half-brother of Jesus, said, Do you lack wisdom? If so, ask God. Ask God and he'll give it to you liberally, without reproach, but ask in faith. And I was thinking, honey, about during the day, today and every day, I just, there's so many things we need to have wisdom for. Some on one end of my spectrum is the computer, and I'm always trying to learn new things and have to learn new things. On the other end, I'm working outdoors and trying to say, Lord, wisdom about these weeds that I have in the yard or here at the church, and wisdom about the blacktop and how to get that. The to hardest shape. working and man I know. Uh, <laughs> and uh, wisdom as far as <gasps> counseling people. It's a, we need wisdom for everything. And I said to the Lord one time, when do I ask for wisdom? He said, when you got a question, duh. And it takes much less effort to say wisdom, Lord, than to try to figure it out. Figuring it out, do I do this, do I do that, do I go on the computer, who do I call? Just go to the Lord and say, Lord, wisdom. If he wants to direct you to the computer, he'll do that. But give him first crack at it. So let's get into wisdom, especially as it relates to God. And honey, we're going to begin with Proverbs 18 and verse 1. Sure. A man who isolates himself, oops, a man who is isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. Well, that's a problem for us, isn't it? A wise, a wise judgment means sound wisdom. When you isolate yourself. Now, when I just said you go to God and ask for his wisdom, you're not isolating yourself from God. And it does not mean you should not go out and even ask others for counsel if they're involved with the situation. If Kelly and I are making a determination on something, we certainly want to communicate with each other about it and pray. But God has to be the final arbiter, and he has to be the one that gives us his wisdom. But don't isolate yourself. Uh, be involved. Uh, to be isolated it shows insecurity, it shows stupidity, uh, it shows selfishness, and uh, is a really a, a formula for disaster. You should not be uh, taking that attitude, I know it all, uh, seeking my own desire. That's what you're doing. When you isolate yourself, you're seeking your own desire. You know, my, uh, someone called me today and said, um, the Lord said for me, her, this person to call me. And so I said, okay. And so they started to tell me a little bit of the story. And so I just kind of related some of my experience of, that, of such a thing of that. And I, you know, and, and uh, this person wanted me to give an answer. So well, I really can't give an answer, but let's just kind of like to talk about it. So we kind of talked about the story and talked about it. And then I, I remember uh, I talked to her about Jesus, some things about Jesus and how Jesus said, you know, um, that he knew what was in the heart of men. And I don't, when I say men, I don't mean men. I mean women, men, people. His own disciples weren't always with him. They weren't always together. And um, so about three quarters way through, she said, I have my answer. 
<laughs> and I knew I didn't have to give her the answer. But the Lord had spoken to her heart, and she had total peace. And um, she, so as I read that, it just reminds me, he rages against all wise judgment. She said, you know, I really don't want to make a mistake on this, but I'm so angry. And through that, so as we talk about it, she said, you know, I knew that I can trust you with this. And that's important because we need to find someone that we can trust, that we can say something to, and they will never turn their back on us. It's very rare to have people that you can really lay it out on the line, say this is the problem because it's raw or whatever it is, and know that person won't take it. And I certainly would not take it to anyone. And so... Uh, and, and so all of a sudden, the Lord gave her, gave her the answer, and I didn't have to give it. And so, but we have to go sometimes to someone that we can find. That's right. And it's always good when somebody comes to you to say, let's pray about it. Let's and we ask prayed. the Lord. We prayed, of That's course. Right. We prayed quite a prayer. Uh, throughout the years, people have asked all sorts of questions of me and of you, no doubt. How do I do this? How do I do that? Amen. And I've always had a choice. If I try to give them my opinion, with any luck, I can tie them to me and I'll become their God. Yeah, right. Instead, I point them to Jesus, wow. and yes. he becomes their God. There's an old saying, which is so true, if uh, somebody wants fish, give them fish, and you have fish for a meal. Teach them to fish. They have fish for a lifetime. And so I don't give fish for the meal, my own opinion. I teach them to fish for themselves by going to the Lord and they'll have fish for a lifetime. Well, what wisdom? What wisdom? Verse 2. A fool has no delight in understanding, but in expressing his own heart. That's that same attitude. It ties in with verse 1. Mm -hmm. You seek your own desire. You rage against any wise counsel. Um, and you don't really want understanding of what's going on. You just want to express your own heart. That's just the essence of egocentric activity. It's just, it's all about me. And what I want. And it could be any of us at any time because we're all sinners. Sure, sure. It happened with Adam and Eve, didn't it? Mm -hmm. They were all about themselves. They, they both uh, sinned. Eve wanted that fruit to be wise like God. Adam wanted to please his wife instead of God. And they lied about it. They blame shifted. And so it went. And we have to go to the second Adam. The first Adam deceived us. But the second Adam is Jesus Christ. And he's the one who makes it all right. Uh, verse 3, honey. When the wicked comes, contempt comes also, and with dishonor comes reproach. Pretty obvious there that when the wicked person comes, there's going to be contempt. There's going to be problems. And with dishonor is reproach. That's why we're talking about godly wisdom, doing things God's way, not man's way. The words of a man's mouth are deep waters. The wellspring of wisdom is a flowing brook. So the words of a man's mouth are deep waters. You hear a lot on the news today uh, in politics and otherwise about words matter. And they do, uh, in, not only in politics, in life. Words matter. Words really express the heart, don't they? They express what they're and so they really do have deep waters. Uh, sometimes we wish they didn't have those deep waters. You say things you wish you hadn't said, but you reveal things. Uh, the other night I said some things that were not right and my wife just jumped on me like a June bug and rebuked me. And uh, I was, poof, went off into a huff into my room to, to uh, was nurse, I right? nurse my wounds. And I just, I was, under, <laughs> I was not that happy for a while. You never said anything and after then, that. Uh, the next day the Lord said, she's right. She's right. And uh, that's why I gave you a wife, <laughs> so that she could correct you sometimes. She has more functions than that. But, that was, but a wife will be able to, uh, and a husband will be able to correct you. Uh, we do need to have uh, correction at times, don't we? And we need to embrace it in order to grow. And then the Lord said, you want to be right or be righteous? I wanted to be right so that my opinion was the right opinion. But the Lord says, no, I don't want you to be right. I want you to be righteous. In this case, I had to say, I was wrong. Forgive me. You know, the funny thing is, is that we, the Lord, about the other night when that happened, I, I don't like to say things sometimes, you know, because sometimes he knows things that I haven't seen or sometimes maybe, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong or, you know, you don't want to, I don't want to go against him. But there, sometimes it comes to where you have to say, I have to stand on something. 
And even if we disagree, I have to be. And so the Lord said, you have to speak what you think is right and you're right too. So you have to sometimes even, we have differences and I have to go against that sometimes because if God calls me to do that, and that's the same with him with me. And sometimes that gets difficult because you don't want to go against each other, right? But sometimes you do. Yeah, and uh, it's important to be righteous. Right in the sense of my way is going to be prevailing now, but righteous, doing it God's way. And we don't always make the right decisions. We need other people around us to help to correct us. Uh, verse 5. It is not good to show partiality to the wicked or to overthrow the righteous in judgment. That is so true. And uh, this is not only for the judicial system, but in our lives, in our um, practices, what we think, what we watch on television, what we uh, believe. Uh, it's not good to show partiality to the wicked and to favor the wicked and to overthrow the righteous in judgment. Um, and so even in our court system, it's so difficult um, to trust the judicial system in any environment, which is dependent upon human beings be it uh, jurors or a judge, whatever the system here, it needs a lot of prayer. Uh, we've, we've, I mentioned recently we had a case not so long ago where the judge was just totally wrong, totally wrong uh, on a separation of church and state. She just didn't understand the point and it uh, took a lot of prayer and it took the God's resolution to get us out of a very bad decision. Uh, so we need to make sure that, that right uh, on God's side is going to be um, prevailing by looking to him to show us how to do it. Don't side with those who are wicked. Don't side with those who are unrighteous. Verse 6. A fool's lips enter into contention, and his mouth calls for blows. A fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are the snare of his soul. The words of a talebearer are like tasty trifles and they go down into the inmost body. So we're talking about the mouth, talking about the lips and the words of a fool. And the Bible defines a fool as someone who is not walking with God. That's the essence of Proverbs here. It doesn't mean uneducated. You can have all sorts of degrees, uh, but if you're, st you're not speaking God's wisdom, you're a fool. And it says here, a fool's lips will enter into contention going to get into trouble, going to get into strife, going to get into arguments. That's why when you're about to get into an argument, it's great to say, wisdom, Lord. Right now, they're all talking about politics and what's going to happen on November 3. And you meet somebody who has perhaps a different view than you do. It's quietly it's good to see under your breath, wisdom, Lord. <laughs> How do I speak to this matter? How do I handle it? How do I think about it? But whatever the, the situation or the circumstance, uh, don't be a fool. Don't get into contention. And if a fool does draw you into contention, guess how many people it takes to have an argument? Two. If you don't take the bite, the, the, the bait, it's over. You're not, not going to go there. So don't enter into contention. And that mouth calls for blows. You, you, when somebody is foolish, you want to just beat them right up. You want to just wring their chicken neck. And uh, that's what a fool does. You know, you can't argue with God's word. And so even if you, whoever you like in politics, I, I've learned that I just stick to, I know what the word says and you do what you got to do and whatever. It's, it's really, those are two men, but this is God's word, right? This is, what's, the word. this is what's real. And so even if there's different issues and there are on different sides, um, you know, I had an instance the other day and, and I just said, you know, it, I, that's, I still believe life is life and that's what I believe, but I don't, not like you because you believe it. You just don't, you're coming from a different spot than I'm coming from. And, you know, maybe God will change your mind someday. M maybe I'm right. I know I'm right about it. <laughs> but even if not, you know, I'm not going to treat this person bad. We just have to stop doing that. I just wish people would stop doing that. Stay with the Word of God. Yeah. November 3 is going to come. It's going to go. And it's going to go. going to ruin all these relationships. These individuals who are running for office are going to come and they're going to go. This country is going to come, and it's going to go. This earth is going to come, and it's going to go. But this word will last forever. In God's mind, there is one thing more important than his name. It's his Think word. of that. 
His word is more important than his name. So let's get on with this he fool honors his word. and see verse 7, how this fool is getting himself into more and more trouble. Verse 7, honey. A fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are the snare of his soul. So his mouth's going to get him in trouble, going to, going to ensnare his soul, going to reveal that he doesn't walk with the Lord. Verse 8. The words of a talebearer are like tasty trifles, trifles, trifles. <laughs> and they go down into the inmost body. We just read that. Yeah, we did. We just <laughs> went back in it again. And, uh, we want, I, the Lord wanted us to hear it twice. You bet it does. And he's a been talking bearer, to me about this all week. <laughs> a talebearer is a gossip. Did you hear what happened to I wasn't Joe gossiping. the My other day? My mouth was running, though. Yeah, and, and I'll tell you, there's something that goes on. Uh, I, I make the statement here, uh, the earth is round, the sky is blue, the grass is green. No reaction to you. You know that. Did you hear the story about Peter the other day and Sally and what they did? And something awakens within us and it's tasty. I don't care about the blue sky, the green grass. What happened to Peter and Sally? Tell me. And then, to make it even better, now don't tell anybody else about this because no one else knows this. Mm -hmm. Oh, I need this delicacy. Jerry, would you like to have uh, a steak? No, thank you. You want to have uh, a beautiful dessert? No, thanks. I want to hear that story. I want to hear mm -hmm. what's going on. And I promise I won't tell anybody at all. That's the essence of sin. That's the essence of the it old nature. It usually isn't that blatant, but it's so true. Yeah. We love gossip, don't we? Yeah. All the newspapers that have, you know, all the, the rag sheets. When I was young, we had, had the rag sheets. I guess they're still around. You didn't have the internet in those days, but you'd have them. You know, they, Remember Tara Abbey? Yeah, well, she wasn't a rag sheet necessarily. No. But they all came out of New York City, it seemed, or San Francisco. But all these rag sheets, all the gossip stuff. And, and you know, they have such a budget. They make so much money. They can defend themselves in court when people are, they, they, the big stars sue them, and they have to pay out settlements. It's just all lies, but... Uh, well, just watch out for those. Don't, don't be a gossip. Don't be a gossip. Verse 9. He who is slothful in his work is a brother to him who is a great destroyer. Mm, slothful. Lazy. Lazy in his work. And that's just the same as being a great destroyer. Mm. How, do you, how do you destroy? If you're lazy on the job, how is that becoming a destroyer? It certainly doesn't encourage people around you, does it? It's going to cause them to sink to a lower standard of performance. Not a good reflection on the Lord. Not a good reflection on yourself. You know, we're here to serve the Lord, to do the best that we can. And well, let's watch out for that lazy side of our nature. Mm -hmm. We all have it. Amen. We have to be aware of it. Now, it doesn't mean we're lazy in all you things. You don't have a lazy bone no, in your body. I'll tell you. We have to... Not well, even a lazy cell. <laughs> Last night it was quarter to eight, and no, oh, I wanted to sit down and relax. No, nope. been a long day, but there were two cages that had to be assembled uh, to take care of our new addition, a little one, two, two pound little uh, puppy, a little Yorkie. So named we have two Sophie. puppies in our house. Two. So she's only this big. I, uh, I, this I felt big. like being slothful. I think at quarter to eight at night, you're entitled to not do those cages. I said, come on, get it done. It's not that big a deal. I didn't say so get it done. So safety will did. have it done. But whatever your situation, no, don't be slothful. Don't be lazy. Um, again, the poem of C.T. Studd comes to mind. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. The great George Whitfield, the evangelist out of England, uh, wasn't coined with him originally, but he used the phrase when they said, slow down, you're working too hard. It's going to be poor for your health. He said, and I love this, I'd rather burn out than rust out. That's him. I'd rather burn out than rust out. So Lord, help me to be busy for you. I said to Kelly, you know, we all would love to, to die a peaceful and quick death. But the one that I would love, if the Lord would do it for me, was the great Smith Wigglesworth. He lived to be 87 or 86. Mm -hmm. And he was at a service. Uh, it was a funeral service. And he was coming up. He wasn't doing the service, but he was one of those in honor. And he came up uh, onto the platform, onto the altar. There were several others there. And he get a, get a big smile, extended his hand and greeted them and was gone. That was it. I said, Lord, I want to just pass away right here at the end of the service in Jesus' name, and then that's it. In any event, let's try to work until the end if we possibly can. 
And maybe you can't work on the job the way Smith Wigglesworth did, but you can work on the job the way one dear man did over at the nursing home where your beloved father mm -hmm. was. And you remember this gentleman came to me and uh, forgot his first name already. And uh, I think it was George. In any event, he came over when uh, I was talking to her dad and, and Kelly, and uh, he came over, he was 90, how old was he, 90? Mm, I don't know. Six? Came over to me and he, I said, how are you? And next thing you know, he starts to lay a witness on me and tries to bring me he to Christ. He was an amazing man. Yeah, he was witnessing for Jesus. And I said, well, thank you very much. And I said, I'm Jerry Lynn. Oh, I hear you on the radio, he <laughs> said. And uh, he was busy working. And he said, you know, I'm concerned about so-and-so down the hall. Uh, I've talked to so-and-so, and so-and-so -and -so doesn't believe in God. I'm going to keep praying and keep working on so-and-so. And then the next time I went there, you know, they all had their wheelchairs and they would just use their feet to move around. Next thing I know, he comes on down like a little little uh, choo-choo train and right behind him is his wife. She hmm. was in the uh, nursing home. He was 96, she was 92. And they were just going to, uh, uh, to dinner and they just waved there. He was working. He was no less busy than I right there in that nursing home. So don't be slothful. All right, let's go on to... Uh, Verse 10, honey. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. The rich man's wealth is his strong city and like a high wall in his own esteem. Well, that's interesting. You've got a little contrast going here, don't you? The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and they are safe. They are secure. Uh, that speaks of those days, the medieval days and days of uh, the Proverbs, where you had a tower for protection. When the enemy came, you would go in and hide in the tower, unless they could build a rampart up there and burn it down or tear it down. But what is your strong tower? Where's your safe place? Now we call it a safe place. The name of the Lord is a safe place. It's a strong tower. Mm -hmm. What is his name? Jesus. Jesus should be on your lips, not when you bang your thumb with a hammer, but when you are needing anything. Jesus, run to that name, and it's your salvation. The righteous run to it, and they're going to be secure. In this time of COVID and all times, we need security. Right now, the world is looking for security from COVID in many ways, including a, a vaccine, which is a very... Uh, a questionable situation at this time, and 35% and of the people uh, recently uh, interviewed said they would not even trust the vaccine if it was in the ground. And so you got all sorts of questions. Is there safety in that? That's I'm not saying don't take it if it comes and if it's proved safe, but always the tower of strength is Jesus. Contrast that to verse 11. The rich man's wealth is his strong city and like a high wall in his own esteem. So if you have a lot of money, there's a temptation that's gonna become your strong city or your strong tower. And like a high wall in his own esteem. A high wall protects me from the world. If I have a lot of money, it's my high wall, it's my strong city, it's my protection. Now, this is only a personal comment, and I, um, that, but it's been borne out by many others as well. When I was a lawyer and I was uh, born again, I began to do a lot of witnessing. I did a lot more there than I do now because I was with unbelievers all the time. And I found that it was much, much easier to engage a conversation with a poor person about Jesus and even get a decision for Christ than the wealthy. I belonged to a club and a country club and all that where I was with wealthy people and I had very, very little success in bringing them to a realization that they had a need for the Lord. I didn't ask what their trust was, but it seemed obvious to me they'd been very successful financially and they did not seem to be reach, reaching out for that strong tower of Jesus. And so uh, there's a temptation when you have money. Yeah, that solves a lot of problems as far as finances are concerned. But what are you going to do in the end? What are you going to do with your soul in the end? And so uh, that rich man does have a problem. Pray for those who are fabulously wealthy, that they can see that that wealth is not really theirs, but it's a gift from God to be used for his glory, by his design and direction. 
and that they still need a savior as all of us do. Verse 12. Before destruction, the heart of a man is haughty and before honor is humility. So yeah. <laughs> before honor is humility. Look at that first part. Before destruction, the heart of a man is haughty. Pride goes before a fall. Before a fall. We've all been there, haven't we? Mm -hmm. We get full of ourselves and we're just, we're just riding high. We think we've got the whole thing wired and the next thing you know, we blow it. And uh, got to come on down to size. Mm -mm. And then that, that brings humility. There's a connection there in verse 12 that pride is going to bring destruction but then as we repent, that brings forth honor. Humility which leads to honor. honor. So there's a, so you know, it's, we don't want to be proud. Humble yourself before the, the Lord. But everything can work for good. Your pride can work for good if you recognize that it's pride and you turn from it and say, I don't want to move towards destruction. I want to move towards honor. So forgive me, Lord. Bow your heart before him. Verse 13. He who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. Yes, we, um, there's an old saying, we've been given two ears and one mouth. We should be listening mm -hmm. twice as much as we speak. We hear something quickly, we have a, a fast answer. That person's wrong. That person did this. That party is this. That judge is that. That's so and so. And so we're very, very quick to speak and slow to listen. Once in a while you come across, there are not many people, but there are a few good listeners out there. I've met a few, not many. People who listen. My father was a, a great listener and he was a judge. He was a judge. And it helped him as, as a judge. He would listen. He was not quick to answer. But when he answered, he was right on. Mm. So Lord, help me to be slow to speak and strong in my listening Amen. ability. Listen Amen. to the whole matter. Pray, ask God to filter out and show you the truth, and then you'll be in better shape. The spirit of a man will sustain him in sickness, but who can bear a broken spirit? So you've got a spirit of a man. That's the spiritual side of your life. The spirit of a man is going to sustain you in sickness. If you have a strong relationship with the Lord, a vibrant relationship with Jesus, you're born again. Even though you are experiencing sickness, it could be mental, it could be physical, it could be financial, it could be in relationships, but you've got that strong tower of the relationship with Jesus and it's going to sustain you until the situation changes, until that indignation passes, and it will. Whatever your problem is, it's going to pass. But keep your eyes on Jesus, keep your hand in his. He will keep you through this difficult time. But who can bear a broken spirit when you don't have the Lord? I don't know how people can, can live without Jesus. I just don't know. When your spirit is broken, how can you bear any situation? Problem of a problem. Jesus is the only answer. The heart of the prudent acquires knowledge and the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. So the heart of the prudent acquires knowledge. When you're wise, you acquire knowledge. You're hungry for what's right and you ask God for knowledge. And the ear of the wise seeks knowledge. You're looking to grow. This incident the other night where my wife had to give me a little tongue lashing <laughs> and uh, my, my flesh didn't want to hear that. My ear didn't want to hear that. But the next day I said, I want to grow. I want to change. Again, I said, I don't want to be right. I want to be righteous. And so help me to be able to say I was wrong in order to be righteous, in order to grow. We are so defensive. We protect ourselves and our image of ourselves. But I want to be righteous, Lord. Help me to grow in knowledge of what needs to be done. A man's gift makes room for him and brings him before great men. Yes, that's been taught an awful lot by Bible teachers uh, in a spiritual sense. And it does have that application. But I like in Bible exposition to always go for the first and obviously intended meaning and then go to the secondary 
application. And this is one that's like that. The, the primary thing here is you have a gift uh, and it makes room for you. Uh, you somebody walks uh, in the door and says, I have a check for Jerry for a thousand dollars. Well, come right on in, mm -hmm. uh, right on in here. I've got the keys to a brand new car and I'd like for <laughs> Pastor Kelly to have, well, come right on in here. She's over here. She'll interrupt what she's doing to be able to say hi to you. When you've got a gift, doors open for you. We're talking about gifts in the human, physical, financial mm. sense. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, and again, let's get back to politics. Does a gift make room for you before a political candidate? Oh, you bet it does. Mm. You bet it does. Sure. But now the spiritual application, which the teachers want to come to, and we always want to end on a spiritual note, is that when you have a spiritual gift from God, don't worry about being heard, seen, mm. acknowledged. That gift will become evident. Oh, boy. That'll That's become good. evident. That's right. You've got a gift for teaching. You've got a gift for mercy. You've got a gift for giving. You've got a gift for uh, loving. Uh, you just be. Don't worry about how to promote yourself. Let the Lord promote you. That's so true. Let him promote you. So your gift, be it in the financial, physical sense or in the spiritual sense, there's always room for it. Always. The first one to plead his cause seems right until his neighbor comes and examines him. And that has a judicial application there and it's so true. The first one uh, pleads his cause, and boy, it seems so right. You've heard that. Mm -hmm. uh, again, going back to my father, his, after he retired from the, the bench at age 70, he went on to be a judicial hearing officer uh, in New York State for the Supreme Court. And he did mostly matrimonials, and he really enjoyed it. I mean, he was sorry for the folks having to get a divorce, but he felt he was doing some good. And he would hear the uh, husband's case, and uh, that seemed very plausible. Then he'd hear the wife's case, and that seemed very plausible. Now, what do you do? You have to really seek the Lord for wisdom. And that's why before he went on the bench, and as he put his robes on, really he would pray for wisdom. Micah, what does the Lord require of you, O man, but to do justly, to walk humbly before your God, and to love mercy? He asked for wisdom. And so, hear both sides of the story. Hear both sides. And again, getting back to the media, pummeling us with, this one said this, and that one said that. Well, you'd and spend, we make our decisions. You should spend all day on TV then because there's so many sides. But you know what I think of with kids? I had a lot of little kids. And when you were speaking about that, I thought about when my kids would get in a fight <laughs> and one would fly in the house, the door would slam and, ah, and they'd tell me the story. And then the other one, you know, would fly in the house, tell the story. And then you get another one fly in the house. That's <laughs> not what happened. And I'd have three stories and they, fist fights. And I remember thinking one time, that's it. I'm not dealing with this. They're all going to bed. <laughs> right? Too and I, bad. I did. I spanked them all and I put them all to bed. <laughs> because they don't, you know, you didn't know who was telling the truth. And we, we went through that a lot when they were little. I don't they, were, they were little. This wasn't last week, was it? No. <laughs> They're all too big to spank. Okay, the first one comes and pleads the case. It seems right. Don't make your decision yet because the neighbor is going to come in and examine. And that's what our judicial system is based on is cross-examination. As a lawyer, I had to learn all about cross-examination and getting involved in it. And um, it was, uh, we, we had, uh, uh, my first case uh, that I had in trial, I lost. And uh, my, my, my uh, uh, client was up there, and what a great case it was. What a tremendous case. You lost? And uh, I, I lost because oh, the dear. other attorney was a a lot more experienced and a lot smarter on that day anyway. Right. And he did uh, some cross-examination of my uh, client and, oh, we didn't look so good by the time we finished. Mm. And um, I found out afterwards, in fairness to me, that case had been sitting around for several years. The other partners didn't want to touch it mm. until the new kid came in. Ugh. Take this case and go up there and handle it. <laughs> In any event, uh, don't, don't make a snap judgment on things. And again, with what you see in the news and elsewhere, pray about it. Lord, you know the truth. I'm not there in the Oval Office. I'm not there in the House of Congress. I'm not there in the, the, the courts. I don't know all the facts. I'm not even sure what my name is sometimes in my own heart. So Lord, you do what's right. Let's go on to verse 18. Casting lots causes contentions to cease and keeps the mighty apart. Casting lots. Now, that's an Old Testament concept. Mm -hmm. they, they didn't have the Holy Spirit indwelling them in the Old Testament. We know that. Holy Spirit did not indwell until Acts chapter 2. 
the day of Pentecost. So to determine the will of God, they would cast lots. The Urim and the Thummim were the typical way they did it through the high priest. In the ephod, the high priest would have uh, the Urim and the Thummim, and all we know it means is lights and perfections. But it's been understood through history and time and tradition that it was two stones, a black stone and a white stone. And so you had to, you have people having contentions, and so what you would do is ask a question of God that would have a yes or a no answer. You take the stones out of the pouch, shake it, and throw it, and that would settle it. Whatever it was, that's how it was done. Mm -hmm. Now, the Holy Spirit is the one who makes mm -hmm. the decisions, and we must use him. We must use the Holy Spirit. I've told this story before, honey, but just a real quick one. Years ago, we had a, a board of elders. I think there were seven of us. Mm -hmm. And these elders uh, made a decision on a certain matter, long since forgotten what it was. And I was in the majority. There were six of us for one way, and one was withholding it. And our bylaws were such that we could outvote them. Simple majority is all we needed. Six is greater than one. You lose. But the Lord touched my heart and said, there's one Holy Spirit... And there's one right answer. And get all seven of those people to pray. And so I said, let's hold off. We can make this decision a week from now. Let's all take this week and pray for the Holy Spirit to speak with one mind. It's like casting lots to settle this matter. And let's come back and vote again next week. They said, fine, we did that. Mm. Don't you know, next week, it was seven to zero. The six of us all switched our position to the other person by the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm. So now it's the Holy Spirit. So when my wife and I are having a difference of opinion, Lord, your will be done. Not yeah. hers, not mine, but your will be done. Mm -hmm. Use the Holy Spirit. He has only one answer, and it's the right one. A brother offended is harder to win than a strong city, and contentions are like the bars of a castle. Yeah, you get somebody ticked off. <laughs> it's so hard to get them back in. We've all had that. You've had somebody that you offended. Uh, I guess I'm a bad boy this week because the Lord laid on my heart to, to text uh, somebody who used to be in this fellowship, and uh, I, I got involved uh, in a rather nasty exchange uh, with this individual trying to protect another individual. I felt that this individual had been very unkind towards somebody else, and I took sides, which as a pastor was a stupid thing to do, and I let it rest, and uh, uh, that was probably a year or so ago, more than that perhaps, you know, maybe two years, and the Lord laid on my heart to get it right, and so I took it, I found I still had the text number, I thought, I texted this individual, and I said, I ask your forgiveness, I was uh, angry, and I was unjust, and I was unloving. Please forgive me. And not too long afterwards, I got a uh, text back, and the text said, uh, thank you for the sweet uh, text, and indicated that forgiveness was granted. And then we had a few exchanges. I got my wife involved on the text, so that I, uh, it was a woman involved. I don't text women alone. I always bring her in on it. And we had nice fellowship for a few more texts and whatever. So uh, when you offend somebody, it's hard to... Uh, win that person harder than a strong city, uh, you've got to say, I'm sorry. It's the only way you can do it is say, I'm sorry. Sometimes they won't forgive, but at least you've done what you can. A man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. From the pro produce of his lips he shall be filled. That's interesting, isn't it? Mm. That kind of cuts both ways. A man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. So you're going to... Uh, Live off of what you say. Say righteous things, and that's going to fill your stomach with righteous actions. Say bad things, then you're going to pay the consequences that way too. It mm -hmm. cuts both ways, doesn't it? From the produce of your lips, you're going to be filled. Mm. Say good things, and you bless others. Amen. If you say bad things, you're hung by your tongue, aren't yeah. you? Yeah. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Boy, we're talking a lot about the tongue, aren't mm. we? Well, James talks about the tongue, and he says that's one member you can't control. Some people never learn to control it either. Oh, I'll tell you. I really, like 60s, they're in their 60s and 70s. I, I talked to someone today, and I said, you know, you really shouldn't. There's another person. I said, you've you got to give that over to God. You can't 
you know, cursed those things. Basically, the person was like cursing people, someone, and their family. You know, I said, you got it. Yeah, they're not right. Well, they may not be right, but you can't, by you cursing them and praying bad things to come upon them, that's how God's going to deal with it, is it, it's wrong. And, you know, God sees the whole thing. Why don't you pray for them? Pray for those people that hurt you. The Bible says, Jesus said to pray for your enemies. Pray for your enemies. Pray for those who mistreat you. Pray for those who use you. And, you know, it's like, what, heaping coals on their head? That's right. Um, And not that we want to do it for coals, but because truly, truly, if you are the child of God, and I've said this before, and I know you've all heard this, if you're truly a child of God and someone does something, I remember my old pastor used to say, nobody is 100% right in an argument. There's always a little, maybe even 2%. So, you know, you're wrong. So, you know, first of all, we're not all, none of us are sinless. But second of all, if we truly believe that God takes care of his children, then we would say, Lord, we'll give this to you, and we know that you're going to take care of it. It's hard sometimes. It is truly hard. Mm -hmm. But God, you know, we don't want to bring God's wrath. We want to have God's mercy on people. Because when God deals with people, it's not pretty. You know, this, this life, notice how strong verse 21 is, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. There's nothing more serious or more impactful than death and life. My ear, how much damage can my ear do? Well, I can hear the wrong things, and that can motivate me to do wrong things. My right hand, well, I guess I could hit somebody or pull a trigger or shoot somebody. But different parts of the body have impact, but not like the tongue. James talks about the tongue in James 3, and he says, uh, uh, let's pick it up with verse 5 uh, on chapter 3 of James. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest, a little fire, kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. Talk about powerful. <clears throat> it's the most powerful member in our bodies. Better put, it's better to put a sock in my mouth. The, the tongue. <laughs> no, really. Like, put a sock in our mouth. <laughs> yes, that's right. Put, put a guard Just on my lips. Put, well, I used to pray it all the time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. So if I, maybe I should try that. I'll get up tomorrow morning and say, oh, dear, what No, why don't, you, why don't you pray that prayer? <laughs> so put a sock in it. All right. Well, that's what you say the next time when I say something stupid. Say, put a sock in it. All right. All right, let's see. Here's one that you love, verse 22. He who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. See that? When you find a wife, you find a good thing. Amen. And you obtain favor from the Lord. If she is doing that what she's supposed to, and my wife does, it's favor from God. Like this incident recently, a couple days ago, I needed to be set straight, and she was used by God to do that. Go on, you're a saint. Keep going. (laughs) The poor man uses entreaties, but the rich answers roughly. Isn't that so true, huh? That poor person has to say, please, please, thank you, could you? And and, and really, it's it's really the the rich person uh, who is counting on the riches and Mm -hmm. does not have humility, does not have the Lord, uh, not so nice. A man who has friends must himself be friendly, Ooh. but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Ooh, yeah, now that's interesting. Amen, uh, Mother Francis says. A man who has friends must himself be friendly. friendly. You know, that is a um, basic statement that has come down in modern parlance to be, if you want to have a friend, be a friend. And we understand that. Uh, and I know people who say, I don't have any friends. Well, do you try to be a friend to somebody? Well, nobody calls me. Nobody does anything for me. Well, do you call anybody? And do you do anything for anybody? If you did that, it's more blessed to give than to receive. You'd be so great, so grateful and so happy that you're blessing other people that you'd hardly even notice they're becoming friends with you. And here's one, again, uh, Bible teachers take the spiritual application, but let's at reach out, take the literal intended one first and then the spiritual second. There is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. 
You'll hear that always being taught as Jesus. That's not the primary meaning here. It's a secondary meaning. We'll get to that in a moment. The primary meaning is, and I, I want to be a stickler because you're, you're, you're missing the, the main point of what he's trying to say. There is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. We're talking about human friends. And we all can point to human friends that we have who are <clears throat> more faithful to us than our own brothers and sisters. Especially if you're a Christian and you have the blood of Jesus Christ, that blood is stronger than the, the human blood that flows through the veins of brothers and sisters. And so thank God for a friend. Amen. But I haven't got any friends. Well, we already covered that. You haven't got any friends? Be a friend. And then be a good friend. And mm -hmm. then you're going to find a good friend who will be there for you, who will be there even when your own family is not there. And thank God for those friends who are like that. And Lord, make me a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Now, having said that, we know that in spite of how wonderful friends are and family and spouses and all. Nobody's perfect. There's nobody perfect. That's right. But it's Jesus who is the friend <coughs> who sticks closer than a brother. He calls me friend. You he know that song? He calls me friend, yeah. I love that song. Close us out, babe. Sure. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, so much that you are our friend. We surely have a friend with you. You are our Savior, and we love you so much, Jesus. Father, we ask that you would bless us now as we uh, sing this song and as we go out and hide these words in our heart, Lord. Oh, thank you for washing us in the precious word of God tonight, for your word says to wash in the word daily. We ask you to go, help us to go forth with joy and to give out the word and love others. We ask this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. He's passing by this moment your needs to supply. Reach out and touch the Lord as He.